Okay. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to today's webinar on impact assessment for World Heritage Part 2, held as part of the ECROM lecture series. My name is Eugene Zhou. Um, I'm the program manager of the World Heritage Leadership Program, which is jointly delivered between ECROM and IUCN in collaboration with ICOMOS and UNESCO World Heritage Center. Uh, the three advisory bodies to the World Heritage Convention, namely ECOMOS, IUCN, and ECROM, are all working together within the framework of the leadership program to revise the World Heritage Impact Assessment guidance. And I would now like to ask all our panels to turn on their videos to wave hello to all our audience here today. Um, I have with me, just as we had last time, uh, Ms. Sarah Court for ECROM, and uh, Ms. Mizuki Murai for IUCN. And Richard, if you could turn your video on uh, just to wave hello, that would be great. And Mr. Richard Mackay for ICOMOS. And I, there he is. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Um, I just wanted to remind everybody that uh, we're the same people who have been participating in the past webinar, the webinar that was delivered in July uh, 16th. On July 16, we had part one of this series of webinar discussing the principles and core facts uh, that you need to be aware of when conducting impact assessments. I would like to emphasize that it is important for you to go back to the first part of the webinar to understand where we are starting from, what the premise of this work is, and to be able to grasp the fundamental principles that we are highlighting throughout the entire guidance document. So before you actually utilize this current uh, webinar for the detailed steps and processes, I would ask everybody to go back to our previous webinar and uh, access those content first as well. You can access the previous webinar recordings through the EEPROM uh, website. Thank you. And I will now try to share my screen. So this is the previous webinar that we had had uh, two weeks ago, and you can access it through the ECROM website. Now, I believe that all of us are now, by now, very seasoned listeners of webinars. <laughs> Uh, and I would ask, like to ask all our audience to utilize the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom window to pose concrete questions during the webinar. Uh, please refrain from raising the hand only and uh, write to us what the content of your question or comment is. So the current working guidance documents for World Heritage Impact Assessment can be found in two references that you can see on the screen right now. The World Heritage Advice Note on Environmental Assessment issued by IUCN in 2013 and the Guidance on Heritage Impact Assessments for Cultural World Heritage issued by ICOMOS in 2011. So, these are the current uh, working guidance. What we're now doing is that the leadership program is working right now to integrate and update these documents. And this is currently work in progress. We had a lot of questions coming in from the past webinar to uh, ask us of where it is, where, they can where you can access it. I do emphasize at the moment, this is work in progress and we're working through several different drafts and continuous reviews to ensure that we can take into account the different practices across the natural and cultural heritage sectors, but also the developmental sector and the impact assessment field. So the updated World Heritage Impact Assessment guidance will be presented at the forthcoming World Heritage Committee meeting. This is intended as a guidance to help heritage practitioners, governments, developers to navigate through the instances where World Heritage is facing change Yes, it does specifically address the issues of OUV in world heritage, but at the same time, the basic logic and principle of going through these steps on the basis of heritage values can be applied to other types of heritage. So today uh, we will be delivering content about the key steps and processes of conducting impact assessments. Please note that 60 minutes is not at all sufficient for us to talk in detail about everything uh, and all the important aspects that we wish to share with you. And 
this webinar should be considered as an abstract overview for you to grasp some key ideas. Uh, ECROM continuously provides capacity building courses on the subject of impact assessment. And our next course will be held in 2021, October, uh, together with WITRAP, and it will take place in Japan. And you can apply to this course. So uh, the questions that we collected from the last webinar, the panel will answer through their presentations today. Uh, if you have further questions, after this webinar, please send us an email and we will try and answer them in writing by posting up a follow-up article on the eCrom lecture series page if there are many aspects that do need clarification. So without further ado, uh, I will now like to uh, direct our attention to the presenters. Today, Sarah will be taking us through the basic steps of impact assessment first. So, and uh, after that, she will be followed on by Mizuki and Richard, who will provide different case studies to illustrate those steps in context. To the left-hand side of the slides, there is a key map bar to navigate through the different steps to help your orientation of where we are exactly in the process. Uh, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank Felipe Keveri for his assistance for the graphics help. Please note that we will be using different case study examples to describe the various different steps just for your understanding of the content. And this is in regard this is not in regard to any of the outcome or the conclusion of the impact assessment report itself. The fact that we use it as an example during this session should not be considered as an endorsement of the entire impact assessment report. So without further ado, I would now like to hand over the floor to Sarah to take us through the steps and processes. Thank you. Okay, let me share my presentation with you. Um, and hello again to everyone listening. Uh, it's good to have you back for the second session. Um, and we hopefully convinced you last time that impact is really important and useful for you. So today we're hoping to offer some insights into exactly how this might work if you're applying it to World Heritage. Um, so in this webinar, as we've said, I'm going to run very quickly through the steps of an assessment before Richard and Mizuki once again, offer you some concrete examples. So the process that we're suggesting here today, we hope it's applicable both in the case when the impact assessment is a standalone report requested by the World Heritage Committee, but as well as when there's a component on World Heritage as part of a broader environmental impact assessment. That is, if it's been requested within your national planning system. And in either case, what we're hoping is that you come away today with an understanding that there is a clear and mature methodology that already exists and that you can adapt to your particular situation. Because impact assessment is a flexible approach and it can be tailored to the specific proposal that you're assessing, whatever size or shape, even if it's being informed by a different national or institutional context. However, the difference between this uh, particular type of impact assessment we're suggesting is that we're doing them in a World Heritage context. So we must remember to put emphasis on the outstanding universal value. Um, and it's important to acknowledge the existing commitments of state parties to protecting and conserving and giving that World Heritage a role in the life of the community. Okay, so let's start to look at the actual steps in an assessment. I'd really like to just upfront the issue of who's involved. Now, there's usually a dedicated team of consultants who carry out the actual work. Ideally, these would be from a range of relevant disciplines, but there's going to be many others who also participate. Now, due to time today, I'm not going to mention at each stage in detail who should be involved. But please note that there will be a range of government departments and agencies involved, not just the heritage sector. And there will be rights holders, stakeholders and the general public who all need to be engaged in different ways at various points, depending on the heritage place and the proposed project. Now, this 
uh, ongoing dialogue with many different people is not just an optional. International best practice for impact assessment is based on transparent procedures and public participation, even if that uh, is slightly different in different national contexts. And when the World Heritage Committee adopted communities as a strategic objective in 2007, it was explicitly recognizing the critical importance of involving indigenous, traditional and local communities in the implementation of the convention. So this issue of participation is a cross-cutting one and you will need to consider it at all the steps that we discuss from here on in. So let's look at what is the very beginning of an impact assessment then. And that's actually deciding if the assessment is needed or not. And this is known as screening. Now your various countries will have environmental heritage or impact assessment regulations. And these will usually specify different categories of projects or sensitive locations that require impact assessment. So a proposal that might affect a World Heritage property often automatically triggers an environmental impact assessment through your national regulations. But in addition, states parties to the World Heritage Convention have committed to the protection and conservation of World Heritage. So in cases where the assessment of a proposed action may not be required under legislation, impact assessment can still be a very useful tool that states parties can use to fulfill their World Heritage obligations. You should note in this uh, very exciting paragraph 172 of the operational guidelines that all proposed actions which may affect outstanding universal value of a property should be submitted to the World Heritage Centre in advance. And this is similar in many ways to a screening process and it can often lead to a request for an impact assessment. So there are various different routes by which it might be decided to carry out an assessment and so once that has been agreed upon, the starting point is then to define exactly what will the assessment be looking at, and that is scoping. So in impact assessments in a World Heritage context, it's important that the scoping includes an initial exploration of outstanding universal value and other heritage values. The proposed project will also need an initial evaluation because these two together, the heritage and the proposal, that will be the basis on which you can identify what are going to be the significant issues and the types of impact that will need to be looked at. So out of scoping, the resulting document can make clear what needs to be done, why and how. And then that document can be used quite usefully as a terms of reference, potentially, for commissioning the assessment and finding the right team to carry it out. If scoping is done well, it's the foundation of the subsequent impact assessment process and it can save a lot of time and money and ensure that the assessment effectively focuses on the key issues. So having defined the scope of the impact assessment and found a team to carry it out, the assessment proper begins. And in the case of World Heritage, this needs to start with a thorough understanding of the property. It is simply not possible to understand how a proposal might impact on World Heritage in the future without having a clear understanding of what it is like today. Now, understanding world heritage, as we all know, is based on the statement of outstanding universal value. So I give you this example from Rome, as that's where we're speaking from today. Um, this is from the World Heritage website, and you can find all the statements for every property on the list there on the website. So if you look up your property, you'll see a description of it and lots of details such as its integrity and authenticity. But this statement of outstanding universal value, which comes in this very narrative form, actually needs to be unpacked if we're going to be able to use it for the very specific purposes of impact assessment. So I give you uh, a little example today where I've begun to do that unpacking. So what we want to identify are the values, both uh, outstanding universal value and other heritage values, so that we can then see 
where are the attributes that convey those values? Now, attributes might be physical elements of the heritage place, but they might be something intangible, like a process. So you see here, I've started underlining the values here in blue, and some of the attributes uh, are circled in green. Now you'll start to begin, that the uh, begin to see that the attributes are what we're focusing on in our conservation efforts. And so identifying them is actually really key to being able to carry out an impact assessment. Once the attributes are identified, then they can be examined thoroughly. And this might point towards areas where additional information, research and study needs to take place in order to really characterize the property well. And a description of the World Heritage property as it is today is often called in this context, a baseline assessment. It's going to be needed at the later step of analyzing how, where, and when a proposal might have negative or positive impacts. So this really does need to be both specific and relevant to that task. And there's a second area that really needs thorough understanding right from the beginning, and that's the actual proposal that's being assessed. If a project is not well understood, it's going to be impossible to identify all the impacts that it might cause. So the precise location of all elements of this proposal and their relationship to the World Heritage property need to be understood well. And this will include, include any other additional infrastructural facilities like access roads or power lines, everything involved that might be required if that project takes place. And in addition to mapping the precise location of a project, you will also need to consider the whole larger area that might be influenced by it. And you're really going to need to, to consider all stages of that project over time its construction, the preparation, its operation once it's actually there, and what happens later in its life? Is it closed? What will happen even beyond that? So we need to understand exactly what will take place, how and when, for the entire life cycle of that project. And so the next step then brings these two together. There's going to be a prediction based on evidence of what exactly might happen to the World Heritage property should the project take place. Now, this requires to a quite systematic cross-referencing of how elements of the proposed action are going to interact with attributes of the heritage in order to identify the significant positive or negative impacts. And having predicted that something might happen, this something needs to be defined. And this is done by comparing two versions of the future, what would happen with and without the proposed project. And this is actually a technical step in the impact assessment and really does need to be grounded in data. That will allow us at the end of the step to be able to really describe the precise character of those impacts. You know, so you see a whole range of different questions that need to be addressed potentially. So that on the basis of these characteristics, we can actually now evaluate if the potential impacts are acceptable or not. Now this step, which is at really at the heart of an impact assessment, involves taking that prediction data and using it to reach conclusions about the significance of impacts. If the assessment is to be credible, this work needs to be really reported clearly and transparently. The evaluation is going to need to result in a clear set of conclusions about whether the positive, uh, the potential positive and negative impacts of a project are acceptable or not. Now, there are a whole range of tools already out there that can be used to arrive at these conclusions and then communicate them really well. We don't have time to go into the details of all these now, but just rest assured, um, they do exist and we will be giving really uh, uh, useful guidance on this in the forthcoming document. So having understood where impacts are likely to arise from a proposal, an impact assessment can then address how potential negative impacts can be mitigated if possible and how potential positive impacts can be enhanced. Now, although both of these areas, positive and negative, are important, mitigation can be the one that's a bit more of a challenge. 
Now, the aim in our case here of mitigation is to prevent significant negative impacts from ever affecting the World Heritage property, or in some situations, reducing them to an appropriate level. In no case is it acceptable to lose outstanding universal value. And in some cases, the only way to achieve that would be not to proceed with the project. But it's really important to note that when an impact assessment is launched at the right time, the assessment team can actually work really closely with the design team. And this allows the steps on impacts, mitigation and enhancement to become iterative. We can inform design choices during the planning process. And this can result in a really improved project. And in the best case scenario, we can simply avoid negative impacts entirely, as long as that dialogue happens at the right time. In these cases, you can then assess the new proposal again, using the same methods to check that you this time have got really good results and to make sure um, if there are any residual impacts and if those are acceptable. So this is really a moment where you can see we're not proposing a simple linear process, but some of these uh, steps will really need to be repeated to get the best results. And having gone through the steps as many times as necessary, the final result is going to take the form of a report. This is going to need to communicate the full process that's taken place and its conclusions, particularly referencing outstanding universal value and other heritage values. There's going to be a range of readers, so the findings need to be laid out really clearly so they can follow the analysis and understand why the assessment makes certain recommendations. And this report is hopefully going to be useful both for informing national decision making mechanisms as well as supporting world heritage processes. Now it's useful to note that the impact assessment report might be reviewed at different stages by different people before it's finalised. Now in the case of an environmental impact assessment there's usually a responsible authority who will carry out a review and many national frameworks provide an opportunity for public review as well. When a report is requested by the World Heritage Committee, the report will be reviewed by the advisory bodies. Now, the review is ultimately about whether the assessment was adequate. This is not the step of deciding if the proposal should proceed. So this is an important moment to really make sure that the report is fit for purpose, both in terms of a transparent and evidence-based methodology, but also with clear analysis of the implications of the proposal on outstanding universal value. Now this, uh, the production then of a, of a final report marks the end of the impact assessment team's work, but it's not the end of our story because this is when the, uh, the actual decision-making takes place by the relevant authorities. Now, if the report's been well written, the decision making will be based, therefore, on the evidence provided and on a reminder of the existing commitments to the World Heritage Convention. And in this case, our hope is that the outcomes are going to be solutions which allow a World Heritage property to contribute to genuine sustainable development, while itself being conserved for and enjoyed by present and future generations. And that would be the happy end of our tale. So thank you all for listening. And now let me hand back to Eugene. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, that was very, very clear. I hope uh, you just had a very good understanding of the basic run through of the key steps. Um, and with this, I would now like to hand over to Mizuki, who will take us through the first steps of the impact assessment process with various different examples being uh, supplied to us from the nature sector. Mizuki, over to you. Thank you, Eugene. And hello again to everyone who has joined us for the second part of this two webinar series. I will follow the structure that Sarah just presented and we'll dive a bit deeper into steps two to seven using case studies from natural world heritage sites where possible. Richard will be covering some of the steps as well to give you some insight into cultural sites and also guide you through the later stages of the impact assessment process. Before I go into the first step, however, 
I'd like to take a moment to quickly recap on the three pillars of Outstanding Universal Value, or OUV. There are many variations of this diagram, so you may have come across slightly different versions of this. But the key is that the three pillars, criteria, integrity and authenticity, and protection and management, need to be present and maintained to uphold OUV. Failing to protect any one or part of a pillar will lead to risking damage to the OUV. For more information on OUV, you can refer to the UNESCO World Heritage Centre's website. I'll be starting at step two on screening as participation runs through the entire EIA process and I'll be referring to it at different points in my presentation. As Sarah mentioned, but, but I'll emphasize again, that whilst this is presented as a list, impact assessments aren't linear processes. It is iterative and some steps may need to be repeated based on, based on the outcomes of the impact assessment. So starting at screening, in addition to national and local regulatory frameworks, there needs to be a screen to see where the project is in relation to a World Heritage Site, and therefore whether the EIA needs to consider World Heritage. This excerpt was taken from a screening report concerning a natural World Heritage Site in the UK. In addition to going through various applicable national and local regulations, it also checks for what in this case is called sensitive areas, which includes a screen for World Heritage Sites. There are certain activities which the World Heritage Committee, the decision-making body of the Convention, has considered to be strictly off-limits inside a World Heritage Site. For example, the Committee has taken a position that mineral, oil and gas exploration and exploitation inside a World Heritage Site is incompatible with its status. It has also taken a position that dams with large reservoirs are not incompat are compatible with the World Heritage status. So if a proposed project fits in this category, the project as described shouldn't proceed further beyond this point. We've encountered cases where screening was not done effectively and therefore World Heritage was missed out. This meant that time and financial resources were effectively wasted undertaking an EIA, whereas a thorough screening process would have, would have either spotted that a project was incompatible at the offset or redone to reassess impacts in relation to World Heritage. The International Council on Mining and Metals, or ICMM, has made a commitment to respect the importance of World Heritage Sites and therefore abstain from mining or exploring in World Heritage Sites. Some individual companies such as Shell, Total and Tulo have also committed to not entering World Heritage Sites and ensure any activities outside World Heritage Sites won't affect the OUV. Similar commitments have also been made by financial companies such as Paribas, HSBC and JP Morgan to not invest in projects affecting World Heritage Sites. We welcome these commitments made by leading companies and the World Heritage Committee has repeatedly called upon other companies to follow suit and make similar no-go commitments to World Heritage Sites. We need to remember that we are dealing with special places which combined still only cover a very small portion of the planet and states parties to the convention have made a commitment to protect the universally accepted heritage values. This pyramid illustrates how only a very small portion of protected areas meet the threshold for holding outstanding universal value, so these special places deserve extra protection. For activities outside the boundaries of a World Heritage Site, certain developments such as dams can have a major impact many kilometres away. So this also needs to be taken in, into account. The World Heritage Committee frequently requests that any activities with the potential to impact on the OUV of the World Heritage Site should be subject to an EIA. Phon Nha Ke Bang National Park in Vietnam, for example, is facing a number of threats, including tourism pressure. The OUV of this site focuses on biodiversity and geomorphology of caves and forests. As a result, the World Heritage Committee adopted a decision last year in which it reminded the State Party of Vietnam to undertake an EIA for any large tourism and or development projects which have potential to impact the OUV of the, prop of the property. Screening would therefore help identify when such EIAs would be required.
scoping is the process of determining the content and extent of the matters which should be covered in the EIA, sometimes also called the feasibility study. At this stage, consultations with stakeholders need to take place, which then continue throughout the impact assessment process. Consultations have to involve active engagements and mustn't rely on public announcements alone. A few years ago, upon the request of the World Heritage Committee, the State Party of Canada submitted a scoping study for a strategic environmental assessment concerning Wood Buffalo National Park. I'm using an SEA as an example here, but the same would apply for an EIA. This site was inscribed under three criteria, criteria seven, nine, and 10. For the purpose of illustration, I'll use criterion seven as an example of how the State Party of Canada went about using the statement of OUV in its scoping study. Criterion seven can largely be split up into two sections. The first about the great concentrations of migratory wildlife of global importance, and second part about the rare and superlative natural phenomena. This latter can be further split into three attributes. I'll focus just on one and two for the purpose of illustration in this presentation. This table is just the first part of a longer assessment of OUV. It presents and splits the statement of OUV by attribute to make clear what the scope of the assessment is in terms of world heritage. Here you can see how the state party has taken the description of the OUV under criterion seven and the two attributes I mentioned in the previous slide can be seen here. In this particular case study, the scoping study has also included a baseline assessment, which I will present next. Baseline assessment serves to identify the original status of the environment before the project starts, so acts as a base reference. This partial screenshot was taken from an EIA concerning a natural world heritage site. As this is still an ongoing case, I'll refrain from mentioning the name of the site or the project, but you'll see that this impact assessment document includes a chapter on the baseline condition, here referred to as existing environmental condition. This covers the condition of all three pillars of the OUV, as well as other relevant environmental data. One of the many important considerations for the baseline assessment is ensuring that there is an interdisciplinary team of experts. This paper, for example, makes reference to an EIA survey for a housing project in Panama's suburban forests, which reported only 12 common bird species in the project area. But when a bird expert subsequently conducted a survey in the same area, the expert identified not 12, but 121 bird species within only two hours, including several rare and threatened species. The paper doesn't go into further depth regarding this case study, but this difference in finding would clearly have a large implication on the project. So it's vital that you have the right team of expertise conducting the different elements of the impact assessment. Understanding the proposed action shouldn't be reserved until after this point in the impact assessment process, because actually project details would have been required this far. For example, the boundaries and the extent of the project's impacts would have, would have needed to have been assessed in steps two and three in the screening and scoping stages. As mentioned earlier, dams can have an influence many kilometers away from the physical infrastructure. But before going into the full evaluation of impacts, it's essential that proposed action is well understood. And this also takes us back to the importance of ensuring stakeholder consultations and public engagement so that people are informed of the potential impact and that there is sufficient time to receive public comments and adapt the project accordingly. The same is true for identifying and predicting impacts. To an extent, this step would have been covered lightly in the earlier steps and links closely with the evaluation of impacts. Project design, including the location, should be scrutinized and consider a variety of factors, including impacts on world heritage and its OUV, but also how this interplays with climate change and natural disaster and so on. An infrastructure development proposal in a known earthquake or cyclone zone, for example, cannot ignore these in assessing the impact on the environment and heritage and must be assessed in addition to and fit with disaster risk management for that site. For the evaluation of impacts, 
I'll use a case study from New Zealand. In 2012, IUCN received EIAs for two projects around Te Wahi Punamu, Southwest New Zealand World Heritage Site. One was for the Milford Dart Tunnel and the other for a monorail project called Fjordland Link Express. These original EIAs did not include assessment of impacts on OUV, but following advice from IUCN, additional assessment of impacts on OUV were undertaken. Milford Dart Tunnel proposal comprised of a five meter diameter, 11 kilometer long one lane bus tunnel with the purpose of halving the travel time for tourists who visit Milford Sound. The Fjordland monorail application was for a lease, license and concession for a 43 kilometer monorail and related infrastructure through the property. In part, based on findings from these additional assessments, the state party decided not to proceed with either of these projects because the possible risk of negatively affecting the World Heritage Site was, was considered to be too great. For the Milford Dart Tunnel, specific reasons included permanent damage to the natural landscape values from the need to deposit half a million tonne of tunnel spoil and the impacts the new, ro new roads and portals would create. For the monorail, the project was considered to significantly impact on the environment, including the site's flora and fauna, amongst other things. With that, I conclude my presentation on steps two to seven and I hand you now back to Eugene. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mizuki. Um, that was very, very informative. And I hope the case studies that Mizuki has been using does actually highlight and emphasize the, the iterative process of the whole impact assessment and how We've broken up the uh, individual processes step by step to enhance your understanding, but these do not necessarily um, are separated out as clear cut different steps and they're all interlinked. Um, I would now hand over to Richard, who will now continue on to give us the uh, more examples coming from the cultural heritage sector to, to describe the rest of the steps that would take us through the entirety of the impact assessment process. So over to you, Richard. Well, thank you, Eugene, and um, good evening, uh, colleagues uh, around the world. Before I uh, pick up the, the process with the, the steps for heritage impact assessment, can I um, make, make reference to some important principles? For example, it's really important, as has been said, that associated people are involved, not just a team of experts, but that multi a multidisciplinary approach is brought to bear on the HIA process. It's very important early on to identify and then ad address any gaps in the information. Uh, it's important, as I'll come to, to articulate the attributes that contribute to OUV, as Sarah and Mizuki have both mentioned, and to distinguish outstanding universal value from other values. This process is not about excluding other values, but uh, this process is very much about the world heritage part of uh, this approach. Something which I'll emphasize in this presentation is the need to separate uh, identification of impacts from evaluating the seriousness um, of those impacts. And I, I would uh, repeat the point that has been uh, made um, by Mizuki that uh, impacts can be away from the property itself. It's important to assess them holistically. Uh, they may be more than visual or phys physical effects. They may affect things like significant use or association or meaning of properties. It's important to encourage consideration of alternatives that avoid or reduce negative impacts. And the HIA methodology allows these to be understood and therefore to be addressed as part of uh, an evaluation and mitigative process. And finally, it is very important that the team which undertakes the assessment is independent. Uh, while the inevitable reality is that often the HIA is funded by the proponent, it is extremely important that the expert or the team that's undertaking the assessment is actually accountable uh, to the relevant consent authority and has an obligation and an ethical framework that is directed at them rather than at facilitating a project or a development. So in this presentation, I'm going to focus on steps uh, four to 11, a little bit of overlap with what Mizuki has already um, uh, 
presented, but with a particular focus from the ICOMOS perspective on cultural World Heritage properties. In terms of the, um, the baseline uh, assessment that's undertaken, it is really important to uh, note that uh, the statement of outstanding universal value effectively provides the roadmap. I mean, world, uh, outstanding universal value sits at the, the center of the World Heritage System. And the place to start is um, the UNESCO World Heritage website. And so I've got a couple of screenshots um, presented for you here on screen. And relevantly, um, if you go to the entry for any World Heritage property, you will find the statement of outstanding universal value commencing with a brief synthesis, but moving quite quickly to an outline of in, uh, the, the criteria that are met and statements about integrity, uh, authenticity with respect to cultural properties and about statutory protection and management. And as both Sarah and Mizuki have explained, um, in these statements, it's possible to go to particular words. Uh, I've used the example of the Taj Mahal here, a, a reasonably well-known cultural world heritage property. And rather than analyze systematically, I just highlight words like symmetry or verticality of minarets, I'd talk about, I'd, I'd highlight words like the protection of the setting. And it is the words and language in the statement of outstanding universal value that give the key to identification of the attributes that contribute to OUV and which might potentially be affected by a, a project or a proposal. In terms of how to assess attributes and values, there were a lot of questions raised about this uh, after the first of these uh, webinar sessions. And at the moment, pending the, um, the uh, availability of the integrated guidelines on which the World Heritage Leadership Team is working, for cultural properties, the 2011 ICOMOS guidance provides uh, a very helpful set of tools, including checklists and frameworks. So I, I put on screen here an example that just shows with respect to cultural sites, questions that might be asked about components or attributes of the property relating to um, in matters such as archaeology, uh, to the built heritage or the historic urban landscape, to historic landscapes, or to intangible uh, cultural heritage or associations. And it is very helpful to unpack all of these, to relate them to the statement of outstanding universal value, and to summarize and analyze them in a chart form. I'd like to show um, an example of, of, of this approach and particularly one that has been used recently to identify relevant attributes that relate to a particular project. Uh, the property that I'm showing is one that's uh, in my home country of Australia. It's known as the uh, Cascades Female Factory. Uh, this is not, of course, a place where females were manufactured. Uh, it is part of uh, the Australian Convict Sites World Heritage property and it was a colonial prison, a factory where females worked between 1828 and 1856. Uh, today, the site has, uh, is, is largely an archeological site with a perimeter wall and a few surviving buildings. And in 2019, 2020, there is a proposal for a new structure which, which will be a history and interpretation center. And um, there is a reference on screen. This is a, a heritage impact assessment for cultural world heritage property, which is in the public domain. And, and I will show you this example in, in a couple of places during this presentation. Firstly, with respect to presentation of attributes and the connection between the attributes and the impact assessment, uh, what's been used for this heritage impact assessment is um, a presentation of excerpts from different citations. Now, I haven't actually used um, the statement of outstanding universal value here because um, it's more useful to show you some of the other citations from Australia's National Heritage List or from the Tasmanian State Heritage Register. And in the examples on the screen, the citation expert excerpts, which are here on the right-hand side, talk about the particular archeological values of the property and these are related to statutory criteria. So by using the real words of the excerpts, it's very clear what the attributes are, what the archeological um, 
uh, values of the site are, and therefore it's possible to identify, as I've done here uh, in the red text, the nature of the impact that the proposal may have. So this is a proposal for a new building to be built on an archeological site. And what's concluded is that the project has potential to cause physical impact on significant archeological resources, including, including the physical remains of the solitary cells in yard three and subsurface deposits associated with all phases of the history of the, of the place. So by adopting this matrix approach that is linked directly to the relevant heritage citations, be it the statement of outstanding universal value or others, it's easy to draw a nexus between those attributes and the potential impact. Now, an important step is then to understand the proposed action. And this sounds very simple for many cultural um, properties. It might be a building or a structure, but in other cases, there may be more complicated uh, aspects of the components of a proposal. There may be downstream effects that are created that are consequences of the scheme hidden effects where there are subsurface resources or effects on uh, the use or the um, important associations that the site has for particular sections of the community. The example I've used here, however, is one that I showed in the first session of this series relating to the historic center of Vienna, um, a matter that is currently before the World Heritage Committee and, and the property is actually on the list of World Heritage in danger. And the proposal that's been under consideration is uh, Intercontinental Hotel, Concert House and Ice Skating Rink. And it's a proposed new building uh, on the site of an existing modern building. And uh, in terms of understanding it, it's necessary to look to the documents, to the drawings, to the reports, to examine photographs, to have briefings and to be very clear about what the content of the proposal is. The next step of course, is to identify the impacts and where the heritage impact assessment for this project is extremely helpful is in the broad contextual and very thoroughly documented approach that it takes to understanding the impacts. Uh, time is short, so I can't show you a 200 page document in the space of 15 minutes, but I did pick out the example that's on the screen where the author of this heritage impact assessment has used Historic imagery, oops, historic imagery to understand the nature of the significant vistas within the property. And then a contemporary photograph taken from a very similar perspective showing a very similar view. And then finally, a, a, a visualization which shows how this significant historic view would appear if this um, development were to proceed. So this kind of analysis provides a very clear and evidence-based route to understand um, the nature of the impacts on the attributes which contribute to the outstanding universal value of the property. How is that then presented? Well, again, the ICOMOS 2011 guidance uh, provides um, some very helpful frameworks. Uh, it suggested that there be a distinguishment between the scale of the change, which might um, range between low to high, and the scale of the impact, the severity of the impact. And there are some color coded graphics provided which scale the impacts between very high, high, medium, low, and negligible. And the point is made in these. Uh, in, in this guidance that an impact which on uh, a site that might be of uh, perhaps local heritage significance, if it relates to a, a moderate change there, it might only be a moderate impact, but the same level of change to an attribute that is part of a world heritage property might in fact give rise to a very, very large and very substantial impact. Now, the color-coded charts are by no means the only way, but the color-coded charts have uh, proven over the last decade or so to be extremely effective in attracting the attention of decision makers and drawing attention to those aspects of impact which should perhaps be reconsidered and which lead to um, focus on appropriate aspects of individual uh, proposals or developments. 
And so an example from this, uh, again, uh, a property that I uh, showed briefly in the first of these um, seminars relates to the um, old town of Gaul and its fortifications in Sri Lanka. And the heritage impact assessment that was undertaken for proposed upgrading of the port uh, undertook a very systematic matrix-based analysis of the values and the attributes, as you can see in the bottom right-hand corner of this scheme, and then ranked the impacts, looking at both positive and negative, using the color-coded methodology, um, leading to a, a large chart which summarized the impacts. And this is only a small selection of this large chart. And I, I would draw your attention to the, the top set of boxes where there is some text, which in the first column summarizes the attributes of the property that are affected. In the second column describes in words the nature of the negative impact and then in the next two columns distinguishes between the impact on world heritage values outstanding universal value or potential impact on other values and i, I show this for two reasons firstly it's a way of presenting the impact evaluation and secondly, to highlight that the eye is immediately drawn to the red and the color coding becomes a very useful technique because it's immediately apparent that at this stage of this development, uh, there was a large negative impact on OUV. And I am I'm pleased to say that as a result of this heritage impact assessment, uh, the project itself was modified to um, substantially reduce this impact before the project was approved. Step eight of the process involves mitigation and both Sarah and Mizuki have covered this to a great extent. The um, pyramid or the hierarchy that I've shown on screen here is a standard approach used by the International um, Association for Impact Assessment and it seeks initially to avoid, or if not to minimize, if not to rectify or to reduce or offset. I would make a couple of comments about this. Um, firstly, that when we are dealing with World Heritage Properties, uh, the intention objective, if not the requirement should be to avoid impact on outstanding universal value. I'd also comment that it's very seldom um, possible to rectify an impact when you're talking about loss of OUV and it is um, virtually impossible to offset. You, you, you cannot say that by impacting on IUV with one property that that impact can be offset by some other activity, activity that takes place somewhere else. So the reality is for um, World Heritage Properties, particularly cultural World Heritage Properties, that when impacts on IUV are identified, uh, the first response should be to modify the project or abandon the project in order to avoid the impact or at the very least to minimize or reduce that impact. And then once the impact has been avoided, minimized or reduced, um, it's then necessary uh, to, to repeat the evaluation. And so I jump back to that archeological example that I showed a few minutes ago relating to the Cascade female factory site in Australia. And as you would recall, the proposal was for, or is for a building being built on top of um, very significant archeological remains. And the mitigative strategy here involved changes to the design so that the building would not actually disturb those remains that were associated with the convict activity that underpins the outstanding universal value. And uh, in conjunction with that, there is to be an archaeological investigation strategy for those areas of the site which have archaeological remains uh, that do not relate to uh, or that are not attributes of the OUV. And so what has happened here is that during the course of the design of the process of the project, the heritage impact assessment becomes iterative, iterative and as the design has changed, the impact assessment uh, is repeated. Uh, ultimately resulting in a, in a terrific outcome where there is a, uh, a neutral impact on OUV indeed, uh, given the um, approach that's being taken to archeological resources, there is also a neutral impact on the other values. Now I'm conscious the slides are out of order here and that is because quite often um, the process itself as shown in Sarah's diagram 
can be internally circular and require rework and some tail chasing in order to get the best possible outcome. As Sarah emphasized, what is also very important is that the um, impact assessment is subject to a thorough report. And, and the report needs to address the attributes of the place. It needs to identify the proposal. It needs to identify the impacts, evaluate the impact, explain any mitigative measures. And an important step that's often omitted is to be very clear about whether or not the project should proceed. And the example that I put on screen here uh, is from Italy, Villa, Villa Adriana, where there was a residential development proposed not within the property, but within the vicinity of the property. And the uh, heritage impact assessment that was undertaken here um, was very careful to identify significant views as attributes and to, in, and to conclude, as you can see in the top right hand corner of this screen, that there was a large negative impact on those significant views which were important attributes of OUV. This in turn led to the decision making, the final step in the project, and in this case, the decision was made, um, I can leave it to you perhaps to read the words on screen, but the ultimate decision was that the only option available to the state party that would totally avoid this situation is to halt the development project. And that is in fact what, what happened. And, and I would say at this point that uh, this is a really, really important point for impact assessment is the bravery and strength in the decision about whether or not the project itself should proceed. Heritage impact assessment is not about identifying mitigation to facilitate projects. It's about making well-informed decisions that facilitate the retention of the uh, attributes and the OUV which underpin the World Heritage Inscription. And so I conclude with uh, a number of challenges. This is not a perfect process and methodology is constantly developing. As I have already mentioned, the question of independence is very important. And while it may be the case that whoever pays the piper calls the tune, those who undertake these assessments have an overarching obligation to provide um, independent, clear advice to decision makers. It obviously needs to be recognised that this process happens in multiple jurisdictions, often within the same uh, state party, and that can sometimes subvert uh, good decision making. The point was made by Sarah that ultimately the obligations of the World Heritage Convention apply to the country, to the state party entity. There is a danger that the impact assessment process becomes the domain of the experts with the focus on experts when actually communities also need to be involved because quite often these properties are places that are also highly valued by associated communities. Um, there are many um, impact assessments which are defective because they deal uh, in a very insular way with the property itself, rather than taking a holistic view, view of offsite indirect and downstream impacts of proposals. Um, there is a, a real danger in seeking to balance positive and negative impacts. And while Sarah rightly mentioned the opportunities to enhance projects, it is not a balancing game whereby adding good things like uh, education programs or exhibitions, you can somehow outweigh unacceptable adverse impacts. Um, and then finally, and, and this will lead to my concluding slide, uh, the biggest danger in the uh, heritage impact assessment process is starting from a presumption that the project will proceed and going directly to mitigation when actually this process needs to be about well-informed decisions. Um, the sad fact is that many of the projects are almost like uh, a game of snakes and ladders. For those who may not know this name, it's a simple board game. And when you land on the square that has a ladder, you go up the ladder but you go down the snake. And for some projects uh, that occur in World Heritage context, there might be a development proposal, in this case, it's a mine, that will lead to an economic feasibility study. In turn, perhaps an announcement from the government or the proponent. 
And at that point, there will be a need for some kind of impact assessment, an environmental impact assessment or heritage impact assessment that is supposed to balance, weigh, make judgments about the benefits and impacts. So there'll be survey, there'll be assessment, there'll be all that baseline material well after the project has been announced. Um, and the heritage resource is, of course, identified and assessed. But by this stage, because the project has been announced in the minds of many of the uh, authorities, decision makers, and certainly the development proponent, heritage is the problem. So the government is going to need to make a decision. And what it does is it will balance economics and heritage. And very often what happens in a linear process is that the heritage impacts are correctly identified, but they're outweighed by the economics and the government announces some community benefits and prosperity. But what happens with the heritage is it lands on the snake and it goes down the bottom of the board to be bulldozed or destroyed, perhaps archivally recorded, and heritage is impacted. And the reason I'm sharing this slightly um, comic but also tragic scenario with you is that this is the trap we fall into with the heritage impact assessment process when we don't build it in as part of the decision making about the project itself and it is predicated on an assumption that the project will proceed. That's not the basis for HIA. HIA in a World Heritage context is about understanding why the, the property is inscribed and important, understanding the effects on the attributes that contribute to that importance and leading to good decisions that conserve our UV. So at that point, thank you. And I shall hand back to Eugene. Okay, thank you very much, Richard. Um, and uh, as always, the snakes and ladders uh, diagram always amuses me at, and at the same time, <laughs> reminds me of the predicament that we're facing <laughs> with many impact assessments. Well, uh, thank you for that, Richard, Mizuki, and Sarah. Uh, at this point, I would just like to ask everybody to turn on their videos again. So because we have a series of questions that are flowing in um, to uh, in, in relation to all the different content that we've provided uh, through the webinar, I would just like to um, add one comment on the issue of translations. Um, as rightfully requested. Uh, it is true that we're only servicing this webinar in English only at this present moment, but uh, we will try and follow up and provide at least subtitles in different languages as we, uh, as we can uh, provide as much as possible. So be, uh, I, I would like to make that uh, announcement just ahead of time um, that it will be forthcoming. Okay, now uh, Richard, uh, if I can, because you've just conduct, uh, you've just finished your uh, presentation. I would just like to um, address one question to you because it actually relates a lot to the snakes and ladders uh, diagram that you just showed us because uh, there was a question and this was a question that was also repeated in the previous uh, webinar is that how can an impact assessment ensure fairness and objectivity if it is being commissioned by the developers and if there are no consideration for the conflicting interests of stakeholders based on different views and interests. So uh, this is one of the questions, key questions I think uh, that we would need some clarification on. Thank you. Well, th thank you, Eugene, and, and th thank you to the questioner. Um, the, the first and simple answer is that the, the system is not a perfect system and it differs between jurisdictions. There are some jurisdictions where it is actually possible for uh, impact assessments to be commissioned by the regulator, but they are the exception rather than the rule. Um, therefore, what's important is that those who are responsible for making the judgments and reporting on the evaluation uh, are appointed on an independent basis. Um, ideally, that they subscribe to an appropriate um, code of ethics through their uh, professional membership, and that the process is open and inclusive. Now, the, the fact that the process is inclusive and might hear from viewpoints from different community sectors, uh, different interests, chambers of commerce, um, local wildlife groups, enthusiasts about history, does not mean that the 
um, responsibility for making judgments is devolved to those people, but it is important that those perspectives are heard, are articulated and are analysed as part of the process. So ultimately, it comes down to a question of um, independence of the team and um, transparency of the process so that people can see what has been um, assessed and how the conclusions have been drawn. Yes, thank you very much. Um, Sarah, I would like to ask you the direct the next question to you. Um, I think this more or less deals with the iterative process that we've been going on about uh, throughout the different presentations. Um, if there was an impact assessment going on and the developer has changed the proposal midway due to the impact assessment, can the original IA process be considered to be finished or uh, how, how should it proceed? And also there was a sort of an addendum to the question um, in many different occasions where uh, people were asking if an impact assessment is valued, is, is a valid process to be taken even after a proposal of a development has gone forward with it. So uh, just different aspects of timing as well, but uh, if you could answer the question, that would be great. Yeah, so if, um, if the project changes, you need to, start again. Um, not entirely because some of the evidence you've gathered will still be valid, but you're aiming to end up with a report that talks about the final proposal that's going forward for decision making. Um, so until that project is finalised, you'll keep going as many times as necessary uh, because it's going to inform whether the project is authorised. So I think uh, it's quite clear if it changes, you, you respond to those changes and see what the impacts are. With, regard, with regards to an impact assessment after the project has been authorised, technically speaking, we're supposed to be informing those authorisations. So really, no. I would, though, just mention a case. Um, Richard just uh, showed the case study of Tivoli, where, in fact, the authorisations were there. The planning permission had been given and everything could have proceeded according to plan. Um, and in that case, it was actually finding legal uh, solutions that was the one of the conclusions of the report that given that the project at this very last minute was deemed to have significant negative impacts, um, it also had to offer solutions of how to get through that mess, difficulty. So I'd suggest it's not ideal, but you don't necessarily have to give up hope if you have a state party that's really open to finding solutions to protect world heritage. Thank you, very informative. Um, the, the next question would go to Mizuki. So there are many countries which do not have the necessary legislation set up for conducting heritage impact assessments. So how do we make sure that we are able as heritage authorities or practitioners to be able to react at the right moment to stop all of these uh, different individual projects from happening? Thank you. Thank you, Eugene, and, and thank you. This is a really good question and, and highly relevant. Um, this, is, this actually takes us into the realm of strategic environmental assessments. So SEA is a proactive process which looks at policies, plans and programs, um, not just projects. So this helps frame individual projects, project level EIAs. SEAs, uh, strategic environmental assessments, are about identifying macro level development outcomes. Um, so it should be conducted and reviewed regularly. We have had a state party recently um, communicate to us that they're planning on um, systematically undertaking strategic environmental assessments um, to, to assess what sort of developments can take place. Um, so this would be a very helpful approach to, to frame what sort of um, individual projects can take place. Okay, no, that's very important. The um, highlighting the proactiveness of the whole impact assessment process that we can take. We don't necessarily always have to be defensive and waiting for the proposal to happen, but there are methods and approaches that we can be more proactive and actually be seated at the table even before any development proposals come into place. Um, I do have one last question. I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry that this is slightly going overboard on time as uh, uh, compared to the original 60 minutes pr uh, promised, but obviously the subject is of uh, great interest to everybody. 
but I did want to pick up one question that was uh, provided through the Q&A uh, button, which I thought merited our attention. Um, I'll read out the question as it, as it is. Can impacts be positive in the meaning that change could enhance the OUV? This is not so that OUV is constant and be con can be conserved or damaged. Uh, consultants sometimes use positive impact uh, as a way of balancing a negative impact and thereby gives legitimacy to a proposal. I think this is one of the uh, key issues that uh, we constantly face where there's this whole balancing act, but also the fact that enhancing the positive impacts, enhancing the OUV is considered to be a, a, of a different uh, way of approach uh, than what we consider as to be the enhancing the impact, the positive impact. So I, I don't actually have anybody uh, foreseen for this question, but I would actually like to give uh, all the panels a chance to address this in their own words and uh, consider that as the concluding remarks, perhaps. And I will give the floor over to Richard because you are muted already. <laughs> well, thank you, Eugene. I think, I think firstly, I would say it is sometimes possible for projects to remove um, impacts on OUV, but, but the notion of somehow um, uh, enhancing and having uh, or creating outstanding universal value does not apply. So of, of course, it's a good thing to enhance projects to provide benefits. And of course, at the end of the day, consent authorities may be making decisions where they are balancing issues, economics, social goods, heritage. But in the world heritage context, uh, state parties have obligations under the International Convention that require them for this very small proportion of the planet to make decisions that ensure OUV is retained. And so, no, you can't get around it by saying, I've got all these other benefits for my project. I'm very sorry about the impact on OUV. The ob obligation is to conserve OUV. And that is why um, the, the, it, is, it is relevant to have specific guidelines for world heritage that are slightly different from um, broader um, SEA and environmental impact assessment processes for non-world heritage places. Yes. Um, I would now like to ask Sarah to give your comments, please. Yeah, I, I think I'd probably echo probably Richard. I think we need to be a bit precise with our language because I would suggest we're not enhancing OUV. We're trying to enhance the project to make it the best it can be. And that will involve both reducing the negative as well as in, you know, enhancing the positive. Um, so we're always looking, we're actually in this discussion, we're looking at the project itself rather than AUV, which um, officially remains the same forever. Um, and then I would just say from a method methodological point of view, I think we need to be careful at looking at the two separately. So I would be looking at negative impacts. And if there is several significant negative impacts that we cannot deal with, that project is a problem and it doesn't matter what the positive is doing. So I think you methodologically separate them, deal with negative things. You're finding mitigation strategies. You're looking at how to avoid them ideally. And when you've done that, you're also in different chapters looking at positive and improving those as much as we can because we can gain positive benefits for world heritage. It might be there's greater protection or a whole series of you know, uh, Rich gave nice examples. An interpretation centre, if it's got no negative impacts, can have um, the positive benefit of really helping the public to understand it. So there's many ways in which we might want to enhance the project, but I would always want to view those uh, separately. Yes, thank you. And uh, Mizuki, I would ask for your final concluding comments, please. Thank you. And I'd agree with, with what uh, Sarah and Richard have both mentioned um, in that, and, and this is why within the context of World Heritage, we don't talk about offsetting OUV because OUV can't be, is, isn't replaceable. And uh, talking about trying to um, modify that or creating new OUV is just simply not within the framework of uh, the World Heritage Convention. So I'll, I'll keep it short and sweet. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, um, I would just uh, like to extend my 
very deep gratitude to all of you for um, participating today uh, in today's webinar, um, especially our panelists from ECROM, ECOMOS and IUCN, all of us. Uh, we're actually working really hard together <laughs> to come up with a much more much better uh, guidance uh, document on impact assessment for world heritage in the future. So please uh, keep up with us in terms of our progress. Uh, as a last slide, <laughs> I would just li like to just share some um, points where you can connect with us um, to receive more information through these links. We're very active on different social media platforms, but also through our different uh, organizational newsletters and websites themselves. So please constantly uh, check them to be able to receive more news about these webinars or different workshops or courses that will take place in the near future. I would, um, I would just like to thank everybody here at ECROM as well, the organizing team who have been behind the scenes always, um, allowing us to have this technical agility to be responding in this webinar and also to all our attendees coming and participating and also asking us very sharp questions, which always gets us nervous and, and to the point. Um, please note that the recordings of this webinar will be made available on the ECROM website very shortly. and. Uh, uh, you can always access it at any time after this webinar is finished. The ECROM lecture series, which has been going on um, for about two or three months now, uh, we will be taking a short break through August, but we will be back in September. So uh, you can get more information about upcoming sessions and different subject that we will deal with through our website. So. With this, I would now like to conclude and uh, thank everybody for being together with us. We've had a lot of number of attendees coming into these webinars. Thank you for that. And I hope it was a useful uh, session for everybody involved. Thank you very much and goodbye.